it's as not, a host. It's, 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 in, in these two cases, you know, there's a little piece of, of Boston real estate property. Uh, but in these two cases, we're really basing the argument of host status on other things other than lands. Uh, again, the, the Revere spot when, when Caesar's Palace was based in Boston and adjoined by Revere, um, Revere got a chance to vote. Uh, so we're just looking for, for the same thing here. And in the Everett one, there's a lot of question. That, that one of the one of the discussions is getting into a, a casino. You have to go through a Boston road. So there's a lot of discussions around this. One last casino uh, question, uh, Mayor Walsh. Assuming that they don't, the gaming commission doesn't give you what they want. You want. And assuming they obviously the assumption they could pick nobody for Eastern Mass, but they're going to pick Everett or Revere. Yeah. Would you cons consider? supporting repeal of the whole law, even though I know you voted for it as a yeah. legislator, if it gets on the ballot next uh, in November? I haven't decided yet on, on where that is. Uh, from my, I understand that that's heading towards the ballot. Uh, it's something I'll make a discuss, decision on. Uh, but it's possible you'd oppose it. Possibly. Okay, let's go back to the calls. He is Mayor uh, Marty Walsh. Mr. Mayor. Oh, um, how about uh, Mary? Mary and JP. Hi. Oh, hi. Um, good afternoon, Mayor Walsh. Um, my name is Mary, and I am a parent of two children who are in Boston Public Schools. And as you know, on Wednesday night, the school committee passed a budget that contained a $60 million spending cut. And McDonough praised the parents for their activism, but at the end he said something interesting. He said that what we really need is long-term activism to make sure that the system is sustainable. Now, how I read that is that he's telling us to push our elected officials to make sure that more resources and money are coming to the schools. So I thought I'd call and see what are your thoughts on pushing the nonprofits in the pilot program to paying more of their fair share so that we have resources for our schools. Thank you for that. I mean, let, let me just, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I haven't spoken to uh, the superintendent about the comments. I think one of the things he certainly might have meant as well is is getting parents active in this school's education because the schools that are doing well in Boston, they generally have a very strong parent council, and, and that's an important piece. And I think that might be hopefully one of the things he's pushing as well. Uh, as far as pilots, uh, every, you know, the pilot payment in lieu of taxes, uh, we have, we're getting some money uh, into Boston from colleges, universities, and hospitals and things like that. Not, not necessarily the tax base, but I've had conversations with the presidents of most of the colleges here in the city of Boston asking them to help us in a various various ways. One is one way is asking some of the, the juniors and seniors to mentor a Boston Public School student. Also working with them to setting up some classrooms around preparing teachers to, to enter into the workforce, preparing principals. So we're coming up with a whole program with our colleges and universities so to use their resources to help improve the Boston Public Schools. Mary, thank you very much for the call. We are talking to Marty Walsh, the mayor of the city of Boston. He's going to be with us until quarter of one, I guess that is. That's and we're correct. going to take a quick break, and you can reach him at 877-301-8970 or via email, bpr at wgbh.org. Hey there, Edgar B. Herwick III here from the WGBH Curiosity Desk. Now, we've all heard that sea levels are rising, but scientists say that here in Boston, they're rising four times faster than the global average. So what does that mean for us? Join me and some of the region's top scientists at WGBH's Brighton headquarters tonight for a live panel discussion about climate change here in New England, part of WGBH's Smart Conversation series. Tickets are still available at wgbh.org slash events. This program is on WGBH thanks to you and the Massachusetts Teachers Association, reminding you that learning doesn't just happen in the classroom. It happens all day, every day. Working together, parents and teachers can make this a successful school year for every child in Massachusetts. And the Boston Symphony Orchestra, presenting conductor Sir Andrew Davis and pianist Yujo Wong, with music of Vaughn Williams, Prokofiev, and Rimsky-Korsakov, now through March 29th. Details at bso.org. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Marjorie again, and most importantly, Mayor Marty Walsh. It's his monthly visit last Friday of the month because he is 
leading the flag raising ceremony in honor of Lieutenant Walsh and Firefighter Kennedy uh, this afternoon. He'll be leaving us at quarter to two. Now, uh, Mayor Walsh, I think you would agree one of the reasons you were elected is you're a man of the people. Is that not? I hope so. Okay. Right. I hope so. Which means the Marjorie and I assume you will be riding the T until 2.59 <laughs> tonight. Is that that's a safe assumption, is it not? I'll be in bed unless, <laughs> unless, unless one of the NCAA uh, Sweet 16 uh, oh. games goes into quarter Louisville versus Kentucky I tonight. Thank you. I think we're doing all right. Yeah? I, yeah, I think we're doing all right. I haven't, I haven't checked it. I'm not as up on, up on it this year, but I watched the game last night. What's happening to me is when I go home, I turn the TV on, thinking I'm ready to watch this, and I'm out. So are you, you going to ride the thing tonight? Are you going to ride it tonight or this weekend or anything? Well, it's we'll it's pretty I, exciting, I, I, I may ride it, but I don't know if I'll be riding at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and those, by the way, tonight is, are over. tonight is the night that the weekend yeah, service starts sense. for the but next you know, 12 months. Find a place to go at that time of morning, I'd ride it, but <laughs> well, I have no place to go. When you were a young, dapper man about oh, yeah. town, I mean, you could have, it would be pretty cool if Absolutely. you could have gotten back home on the tee at, at, at 2 o'clock in the morning or 2.30 in the morning, correct? It would have been a lot safer, too. Yeah, exactly. on the train. No, I think it's it's a great a great service you know one, one thing that we're going to have to make sure that people take it if we want to keep it it's about ridership and about you know the, the revenue really generated is not going to really pay for it but what it does it gets people on there we have to get people on the trains to take it plus it keeps people off the roads uh, allows people to keep their cars at home um, and, and hopefully uh, hopefully it'll be a success yeah. the trains and most popular bus lines is that yeah, not correct that's, that's included yeah. in the deal it's starting for tonight workers yeah. too they have to work it's the great for workers a yes, lot of work because what happens is I had a young man that helped me on the campaign, and we talked about this one night in the car. He was uh, bussing tables as well, and you know he'd make seventy, eighty bucks, of course, over the night. And he twenty-five. He lived in Brighton. Twenty-five bucks to take the cab. So you know you're working for fifty bucks. Let's go back to the phones. He's Mayor Marty Walsh. How about Lynn, Lynn in Boston? Hi, Lynn. Hey, I have a question um, as a law landlord about the rental inspection process. Yeah. And I, I heard recently that you want to amend some of this. But I have real concerns about how this was set up, how small landlords were never notified this was happening. In the prior response of ISP, when would there be reported violations? <coughs> um, I found that they weren't very responsive, and now the city is hiring 12 more new inspectors for life. And they didn't. I don't think they did their job before. Now we have... Big brother watching us coming into our home. Well, let me let me try and respond, Lynn. <laughs> this this um, ordinance was put in place prior to me uh, being elected mayor of Boston. It was put in by the last city council, and the inspection ordinance uh, basically ha obligates that every land every landlord, every apartment unit in the city of Boston gets registered with the city. It really, I think, was in response to uh, slumlords and, 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 and property owners that just don't take care of their property here in the city of Boston. When I took over, uh, I had actually discussed this with the Small uh, Property Owners Association, and you know they had said to me they had some problems with this. So we looked at this law. What I did, what we did, what we're going to propose we're doing. Any homeowner occupied uh, one to three family, uh, they're still going to be required to register your apartment, but it's going to be at no cost, the fee, and also people that own uh, home, home homeowner occupied one to six family. Uh, you can send a letter in for a hardship waiver. Uh, this is going to be about, we're sending back, if this passes, about $363,000 in fees back to the homeowners. We're going to make it retroactive back to the beginning. But the reason for this this piece put in place is because we have 25,000 properties right now in the city of Boston that are on the um, the bad list of, 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 of rental units in the city of Boston. And generally, when you go around the neighborhoods, the street where that has a house that's the worst house in the street. It's not an owner-occupied house. It's a usually a, a landlord, an absentee landlord, who has it as a, a, a profit um, property. And you, they got to go back to the neighborhoods and help us. Lynn, thank you uh, much uh, for the call. Uh, Mayor, let's go back to the phones. That's, um, how about Sheila from Norton? Hi, Sheila. Um, hello, Mayor. I um, appreciate your taking my call. And I just wanted to say when I was sort of touched by your co um, comment that you just said whatever came out of your mouth um, while you were at the press conference. And I think from uh, I perhaps I'm speaking for a lot of people that your sincerity comes across loud and clear very quickly in your um, uh, in your service to the to the city. So I think you can always rely on that. Um, it's, uh, you're definitely doing a wonderful job and have established something very quickly in the in a, such a short time. Um, on the fireman side, I was kind of um, 
was very chilling to see firsthand, as, or not firsthand, but on the TV with the, one of the firemen going up a ladder with so much equipment yeah. and wearing the uniform that looks so heavy. And I just wondered, um, I assume that the city stays up on technology for our firemen, and uh, perhaps maybe you can tell us how they do. I just hope that someone takes from this, um, you know, someone who can invent more things, um, that perhaps those poor firemen, I don't even know how he got up that ladder with all the waste on him. And um, I just hope that the city keeps up to date on things for them. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I had a, I had a meeting. We, we're heading into our budget season right now, and I had a meeting with the commissioner and talking about the fire department's budget. And there's constantly new equipment coming out, and we're trying to stay ahead of it. One thing that I found was surprising was that washing of the uniforms, um, you know, the jackets and the helmets, is an important piece because of all the soot that's in there. That it carries a lot of a lot of you know potential cancerous oh, I didn't effects. Know that. I didn't realize it. The the pants and you know they they bring them to a, they have a basically a laundromat that does the cleaning of their equipment. So keeping the equipment up to date, keeping the helmets up to date, constantly upgrading technology is something that that happens here. Uh, you know the, the different types of much like an athlete when they come up with new ways of protecting the body, the fire department comes up with new ways of protecting the body, and the same for the police department, quite honestly. Um, so we, we, we're staying ahead of it. Um, you know, I think um, in Boston we have a, a great fire department, and as we move forward here, we're, we're in the process of going through a process to pick a new commissioner. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, technology-wise we're number one in the country, preparedness we're number one in the country. We're going to continue to work on those things. Sheila, thanks Sheila, for the call. Sheila, I think if you're a really a true fan of uh, Mayor Walsh, you are Sheila from Norton. I think you better become Sheila from Boston <laughs> yes. so that you can vote <laughs> for the mayor. Put your money where your mouth is, Sheila. It's in the future. Uh, oh, good. Yeah. Sheila, oh, yeah. thanks. By the way, Mr. Mayor, did you read uh, Shirley Leung's uh, uh, column in the in the uh, Globe today, note to BRA, honeymoon is over. Did you read it? Yeah, I read that this morning. Well, let me read a sentence to you. Uh, it says, frustration is building as developers lose patience with waiting for basic guidance on how to proceed on projects. The problem, they say, has been that Mayor Marty Walsh, which is you, has adopted a hands-off approach to development, but without handing it off to anyone in particular. Guilty or not guilty? Uh, first of all, I haven't heard one complaint uh, in the business community to me or, or to our folks. Uh, it's funny, when I read that one line, you know, uh, Tom Menino was criticized for making every single decision in the country. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting criticized for not being making every decision in, the, in this thing. Uh, no, not guilty. We're working closely with, uh, with uh, Brian Golden. Uh, Who's the acting? The acting yeah. BRA director. Brian's meeting with developers. I've actually met with some developers uh, since I've taken over, and we're moving pro projects along. The BRA had 12, uh, in the last 12 weeks, six meetings. Um, I certainly would love to propose things, but th pretty much everything that was in the queue got got approved before I, I got sworn in as, as mayor. Uh, we are working on some new projects. We're working on some exciting projects, and we're going to have – there's no slowdown at all. And, and the honeymoon's probably over, but there's no slowdown. How thin-skinned are you? When you read something like this, I mean, you're fairly new to this. It doesn't affect me. But does it really not affect you? It doesn't affect me. So do you get angry at the – I mean no. this sincerely. Do you get angry at the writer of the thing? No, it doesn't affect me. You know, I, I – it just doesn't. That's good. Uh, so if I write something bad, you, you, you have. have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. You criticize. I don't think you've gotten most of it. We were open. It was something you went at me on. Something. But you oh, really, right. this does nothing. No, it doesn't. You can't govern by the press. You have to govern when you make a plan, whatever it might be. You certainly can take recommendations. There's no question about it. When there's an article written, I read it. Um, you know, sometimes uh, the paper will do an op-ed and suggesting something, and, and I'll take that into account. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, there was a, a reporter for The Globe. Uh, ed education reporter uh, who was very, very bright on the issues of education. I would have no problem calling a reporter, asking them questions. I would have no problem calling Paul McMorrow or Casey Ross and asking them some questions on what they think about development because they cover it. Mm -hmm. They know it well. So I'm, I'm not concerned about that. But when an article is written um, with, with no sources, um, uh, I, it doesn't bother me. So, and you read stuff about yourself. You're not one of those phonies that says, oh, I don't read it. No, I read, I read it all. I don't read the comments online. I think they're ridiculous. But I read I read because uh, those people. That's where I do my writing. They put a fake there. name. If you're going to criticize somebody, put your name. At least put your name. The guy courage should put your name. Oh, over. I'm with you, Mr. Mayor. I'm with you, Mr. Mayor. You no need... one has suffered more from comments than the woman no. you're I'm not, standing I'm not to the side of. with the Boston Eight Carol seven readers. seven <laughs> three zero one eighty nine seven. Let's try to squeeze in a couple more calls uh, if we can. How about we get Vinny from Woburn? Hey, Vinny. Hey, how's it going? Good, Vinny. How are you? 
Good. So, Mr. May, I have a question. Uh, about the res uh, Boston being a host community, the original plan for the casino in Revere was both in Revere and Boston. It wasn't that the casino was in East Boston and Revere was granted host community. They were both host community communities because the casino was in both. But now that actually, it's actually totally the, in Revere, then I understand why Boston would be a host community. For that matter, if you had to get through Boston to get to the casino, you have to get through Revere to get to the airport, and yet Revere reaps no benefits from the airport. Hey, t t tell me the difference in the proposals. What, what's there? What, what's changed as far as Boston Revere status? The, the casino got moved three feet over into Revere. Can you explain to me what's changed that Boston wouldn't be a host community that, that what we fought for? It's the, not the casino is actually going to be in Boston. It's not going to be in Boston. So no, how, how do you, the casino, none of the casino at all will be in Boston. How do you get into the and casino? In the original proposal, it was in both cities. That's why both cities voted. Vinny, the mayor just asked you a question. How do you get into the how do you casino, get into the casino? If it's in Revere? I'm sorry? How do you get into the casino, he asked you? If it's in how do I get into the casino? Yeah, how am I'll I going? Go I'll go through Saigus. So, so you got... <laughs> I mean, I don't have to go through Boston to get to the casino. You don't, Vinny. So you, but, but, no. yeah, but somebody from the South Shore does. Vinny, okay, we got so, it. We understand your point. Thank you for the call. No, I, Can I, I get back to your point of a minute ago, uh, Mr. Mayor? Is, is, are your lawyers saying that the more amorphous issue that I find more powerful, frankly, is not as a legal matter, but uh, uh, emotionally, that the lure, if Everett or Revere gets a casino, my assumption is the ads are not going to say to the people across the country, come to Revere, Massachusetts. There's no disrespect intended toward to Revere or Everett. It's going to be come to Boston, the Las Vegas, or whatever they're going to say. Come to the Bo new, brand new Boston yeah, state-of-the-art casino. Boston. Listen, Do your lawyers say that ha argument has we'll, any we'll, merit? We're we'll putting all that together. That's going to be part of the cause. Let me just, let me just clear the air, because Vinny clearly um, is a supporter. I commend the mayor of Revere and the mayor of Everett for the work they've done. They are fighting extremely hard for their two towns. I support I support the legislation to give them that opportunity to fight for their towns. Uh, this isn't about Re against Revere or against Everett. This is about an opportunity for, for joining communities next door that would have the opportunity to, to vote on this proposal. That's all we're saying here in Boston. We are going to make a very strong argument because I feel we're a host community in both. We are going to make a very strong argument, and we'll, we will see what happens uh, after that argument is made. Did you? Uh, are you aware that at a joint WGBH-LGBT community uh, forum for gubernatorial candidates that Steve Grossman passed the kidney stone? Were you aware of that? It's no, true. I missed that. Well, actually, there is a That's Twitter kind of account. scary right now. It was very scary. There is a he Twitter account. He was great answering the questions, and then he sat down, and he was grimacing, and, and David Bernstein, one of our associates here, noticed that poor Steve Grossman was in significant pain. So uh, there is actually a Twitter account now, I know it's hard to believe, that's called Grossman's Stone, <laughs> and it is tweeted in a question. For, I mean, it is what it is. Okay. tweeted in a question. Has Mayor Walsh ever passed a kidney stone. Oh, they're brutal. I've had... I've no, had, you've not. I've had two two procedures uh, for kidney stones. One was called lipotripsy, where it's like a spark plug that, that breaks the kidney stones up on your back. And the other one, you have to pass it naturally. They're brutal. Yeah, and once you have them, you have them forever, they say. Well, like, I know. Like childbirth, I say. I have... I have uh, you know, I went for a physical a few months ago and he did the whole test and, and my kidney stone, they're there. Yeah, they're brutal. They're very painful. Actually, the first time I went to the hospital, I went to county hospital and I went in with a kidney stone and, and the nurse came into me and she was laughing because she looked at me and she goes, now you know how we feel as women. <laughs> I said, I'd never say anything against you. That's what they say. It's like uh, having a baby I don't without know. any hey, drugs. I love you. Mr. Mayor, you only have a couple of minutes because I know we were leaving earlier today, as we mentioned, because of the flag raising ceremony in honor of the two firefighters. Uh, you said something is really important, and I know Marjorie and I care a lot about it too. You've been making a major push, like your predecessor, by the way, on this whole teen summer yeah. job deal. Uh, how's that going, and what's the push? And if there are employers, small and large, who are listening, who uh, want to get into the process, uh, what do they do to uh, to register, to say, I've got three positions? What, what do they do? I know your goal is, what, 12,000 you're looking for? Yeah, we're looking anywhere from 10 to 12. We'll try to do more than last year. Let me just take two seconds to explain the program. Please do. We have, uh, obviously, in the city of Boston, we do summer jobs uh, for the kids. We're putting about $5 million into the budget this year to, to hire kids to do summer jobs. We have large employers like State Street and, 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 and uh, John Hancock who employ hundreds and thousands of kids. So if you're a business in Boston, we'd, we'd love for you to, to take a couple of kids. If you're a big mid-sized business, uh, basically what you do is you, you're going to sponsor some kids. They're going to work in your company. They're going to do internships or whatever you want them to do. 
It's a great way to, to mentor young people in Boston. If you're looking to get back and you want to do something about the kids and keep them off the street, do this. And the best way to do it is Boston, bostonsummerjobs.org. If you go to that webpage, we have all the information up there where you can sign up. We have hundreds and thousands. We have hundreds of employers right now. We, we want to get to 1,000 employers. Boston. BostonSummerJobs.com. You know, .org. I, I know you got to go. .org. To, .org. I, .org. I know you got to go to this uh, flag raising, but tell people what's going to happen in a little while at City Hall Plaza. We, uh, we, uh, we lowered the flag um, the night that we lost the officers. Today we're going to uh, have a prayer. Father, Father uh, Mahoney, the chaplain of the Boston Fire Department, is going to say a prayer. Uh, we're going to have a moment of silence. And we're going to raise two Boston Fire Department flags uh, above City Hall uh, out of in honor of uh, Lieutenant Walsh and, and Firefighter Kennedy. Um, people want to do something. There's going to be a there's a sympathy book that you can sign. You can go on our web page. Um, there's going to be some family members there as well, I believe. And it's just a place for people to go and be able to exp say something. You know, earlier in the show we talked about people want to do something. You know, and you can donate to the fund, or you can say a prayer, and if you want to physically go somewhere, City Hall Plaza today. Uh, what time is this thing? Uh, one, about, one, about a half hour, one fifteen. Uh, we're going to be doing it, um, and, you know, there'll be bagpipers there. The commissioner of the of the fire department uh, is going to be there. Richie Paris will be there. And there's President of Boston, uh, Boston Firefighters fire, Local, yeah. There's a lot of people, a lot of firefighters want to come. They just want to go somewhere. People just want to go somewhere. And and they want to be with people, too. And if there's an opportunity for people to come together, and I think there's a lot of employees in City Hall that are going to be out there today that want to thank firefighters that show up. And, by the way, that fund, if you can't make it today or even if you can, as the mayor said before, is BOS uh, Fire CU for Credit Union, BOSFireCU.com. Mr. Mayor, thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, for being with us. We much appreciate it. Mayor Marty Walsh joins us the last Friday of every month for Ask the Mayor. Up next, we get an insider's take on the Jared Remy case and the death of Jennifer Martell. That conversation next on 89.7. Congress can't make a decision on health care. What else is new? And so once again, doctors are facing a big pay cut. Medicare patients need doctors. This is for the patients. It's not for the doctors. Don't look at us. Make a decision on Medicare doctor salaries and stick with it. Too much to ask? The so-called doc fix dilemma. That's next time on The Takeaway from PRI, Public Radio International. This afternoon at 2, here on 89.7 WGBH. Funding for our programs comes from you and Olin College of Engineering, working to educate the next generation of engineering innovators to solve the world's complex technical challenges. More information online at olin.edu. And Floor, providing custom area rugs, runners, and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting with Floor Carpet Design Squares. In-store design assistance available at their store at the corner of Newbury and Clarendon. That's flor.com. Carpet is boring. This isn't carpet. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Mardrigan. As you know, we've discussed it. We assume you read it. The Boston Globe published a detailed history of Jared Remy's violent past and the lenient treatment Remy received from our judicial system this past Sunday. We're joined by Christina Hill. Christina Hill was a good friend and next-door neighbor of Jennifer Martell. She uh, sadly... Uh, witnessed uh, the death of Jennifer Martell, and she's here to talk to us about her friend, a project she's working on in memory of her friend, and some of the things that happened leading up to that. Christina, it's good to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Thank you. And thank you for being with us, Christina. I saw you last night on, on, on Jim's show, so I know that uh, you're a young mom. Jennifer Martell was a young mom. Your kids, you hung around together as young moms. What did you do? Um, <laughs> we did lots of things. Um, we went to the beach together. We went to, to Cape Cod to, um, uh, we took Ariana while I was still pregnant to, um, the zoo lights in, um, Stoneham, I believe it was. Oh, yeah. Uh, and she rode all the rides, the carousel and stuff there. And we have 
pictures of her sitting on Santa's lap. And uh, we took um, Ariana to the Science Museum and uh, to the Omni Films. There was uh, one about uh, reef, reefs, I think, at the time. She lasted about five minutes because she got scared of the of the big screen. But I get scared shoots. by that same yeah. screen, by the way. That's hard <laughs> so, to say. So you were friends for, what, what, about a year and a half or so? Yep, si 16 months, yep. And how well did you know uh, Jared Remy, the fa Ariana's dad? Um, too well to admit, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I mean, we were we were neighbors, so the same way that we treated Jen, we treated um, Jared. I mean, we took him to get ice cream and, and bought it for him. He used my car in several times when his tire popped or something wasn't working. Uh, I'd just hand him the keys to the car. Um, you know, we, we, we had a, a neighborly relationship with, with him as we did with Jen. And the first few months of your relationship with them and being a next-door neighbor, you shared a wall, I know. Uh, there was you saw no sign of Jared being the abusive, violent guy who we read about in the Sunday Globe. Is that is that correct? Yes, I didn't see an abusive or, viol or abusive or violent relationship. I definitely saw a relationship that was incompatible, and I also saw, um, you know, a, a bad guy. Uh, as I what do you mean by that? Um, the, the, the bad guy yeah, reference. The bad guy, yeah. So the first week that, that we moved in, Jared, um, was bragging to the neighborhood. We were all out with our dogs that he was going to get a swastika tattoo on his arm. He was an extremely racist, extremely homophobic, like, mean person when you ran into him you know he'd usually be talking about somebody or something that did something to him and when he wasn't talking about that he was bragging about the fact that that supposedly jerry gave him ten thousand dollars a month to live Jerry being what? his father, as we know, Red Sox broadcaster, former Red Sox player. So he seemed like an angry guy. Yes. Because yep. he's it wasn't that tall, five foot seven, I've read, but a big guy yes. in terms of money. So is this is scary to you? Uh, no. He'd sit, stand there with his shirt off and his belly sticking out, like eating, stuffing his face full of ice cream or whatever else. And and uh, I, I honestly thought it was funny. I thought he, I thought this was all a front. Like, he just acted like this, like... Like, excuse my language, loser that that had no job, that didn't, that had no ambition, did nothing with his life, and and so he thought it was cool to act like a thug and just um, talk trash about people and and say horrible things that were were of shock value. But you know, he also he had had in, like an intelligence as well. If you sat down and talked to him, he could tell you everything about the Republican convention or or you know about um, his political views or about what was going on in the world from from a perspective of wars or anything yeah. else. Um, so he wasn't a dumb guy. He just, he just, I think, I, we thought that he was just, like, putting on a front to make himself look cooler. So Jennifer Martell was trying to get degrees, and she was working, and, and so forth, so she was obviously trying to get ahead in her, in her life. He was babysitting for Ariana for a lot of the time. Was he an attentive dad, from what you saw? Um in my impression, no. Um, you know, it depends on what what someone's belief on what a good dad yeah. is or, or what it means. And and you know, to me, taking your child places and 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 culturing them and and um, and teaching them acceptance and uh, equality and kindness and charity, those are things to me that are qualities of, of a good dad and and uh, teaching them the, the difference between right and wrong and morals and and I saw none of that but you know if if, if your perception of, of a good parent is that he was there for her uh, then yes yeah speaking of parents one of the things after having read about you and then having met and having an opportunity to speak to you last night one of the things that I find so I mean the first thing I find odd is that someone who sounds like such a wonderful young woman like Jennifer Martell with so much ambition could be with someone who was so violent and and ambition free but that's a story for another day the other thing i find incredibly odd you told me and confirmed that that jennifer martell for phil had very warm feelings for the remy family for jenna Rem, remy the daughter in particular but wasn't so crazy even about her own parents she was that that is a fair reflection of your sense of jennifer martell's feelings isn't it or is it Yes, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to get get into it too much because I know both families are are grieving the loss loss of of an amazing person and and uh, and uh, you know I can't 
imagine what the Martells are going through knowing that, that that's their daughter. You know, she was my best friend and, and I can't even handle it. Um, um, but, but there was, there was distance there. I think, I think Jennifer was, was the first in her family, as it was mentioned, um, to go to college and, and there was a bit of difference in, 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 in drive, um, there and, and, and her goals and, and how they matched her families. And so I think she, she, she felt a bit, uh, um, different than them. And, um, the one thing that people have to understand about Jennifer and, and, um, I've, 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 you know, tried to keep up with what's gone on since, since the Globe article and there's been a lot of victims victim shaming going on and uh, Jennifer was not a weak girl like this was a girl that could take on the world she was smart and and driven and 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 you know a workaholic and and de like dedicated and devoted and anyone at market basket can tell you that like they could a ask her to do something and she she would do it she was so reliable that's where she worked and accountable yep. yes that's correct and um and so but but she was also completely selfless and she also like had this um, innate like empathy for people and I think that she thought she could save Jared and it wasn't an ish like you know it wasn't a compatibility thing where, where people are asking you know why why was she with such a thug I genuinely think that she somehow saw these good qualities in him that no one else including myself saw and uh, and she genuinely till the end I think thought she could save him you know one last thing about, about the fact Families. Then we want to get back to obviously what happened in the couple of days leading up to the uh, the uh, death of your friend. And by the way, for those listening, uh, uh, the, uh, Christina has asked because there's a trial pending that we not talk about the events of the the night itself where she lost her life, which we will respect obviously. In light of her incredibly warm feelings for the Remy family and you know iffy uh, feelings at time for her own, based upon your closeness with her and your knowledge of her. Who would she have wanted to have primary custody of Ariana had she had something happen to her? Well, this is something that my husband and I talk about between us a lot. I think that prior to what happened that week, um, I think she 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 may have wanted the Remy's to to have custody of of Ariana, um, but you know, and maybe this is this is a self selfish belief. But mm -hmm. my husband and I genuinely believe that she would have wanted Ariana to be with us. And you you wanted that to happen, did you not? Yes, we did. We we put we filed for custody of her, um, but because we were not blood, we 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 were denied. That's the voice of, of Christina Hill, who is you know, I'm sure was the next door neighbor and close friend of uh, Jennifer Martell. I'm sorry, Marjorie. And I'm just going to say, and people may not know this, that the Martells, Jennifer's parents, now have guardianship, and the little girl will also see the Remy family oh, and another member of the Martell family. But it seems as though she's going to be spending most of her time with the Martells, and you think that might be um, not the wishes of Jennifer Martell. Um, I'm very happy with the arrangement that came to play. Um, uh, the the um, the Martell Juniors are amazing people, and I think that that they they will do a wonderful job taking care of Ariana. That's but, the brother. That's uh, the brother. Uh, yes, your brothers yes. and sister-in-law of Jennifer. Yeah. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And I think they'll do a wonderful job taking care of her and give her the love that she, she needs. But selfishly, as I'll say again, you know, we would have loved to have have had that honor as well. So. Okay, so um, we're not going to get into the, as Jim just said, the actual night that that Jennifer lost her life. But the, the day before that, uh, you, the two of you, were together. Tell people about uh, what happened that the day before. Sure. So um, I woke up in the morning. My son's crib was in my room, and they had stayed in our guest room. And so I was. Uh, Ariana and, and Jen, Jen, Jen stayed in our guest and room. And why did they stay in your guest room? Because she was scared of everything that had happened the night before. So um, you this know. is when uh, Jared Remy purportedly slammed her head against the mirror. The yep. police were called, and yep. Yeah. So it was a really traumatic night. It was the 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 second of two times I ever saw Jen cry, and. Um, and so they spent the night at my house, and I bought um, Ariana some some Papa John's, and she was feeding it to my dog <laughs> on the couch <laughs> instead of eating it herself. So she was. Uh, so I I turned around, and she's like feeding chicken wings to my <laughs> my dog, and um, and. And so they they stayed overnight, and uh, and in the morning, you know, I got, I, I got dressed and brought brought my son downstairs, and um, Jen had snuck over to to her house to get 
some yogurt, which I, it was chocolate yo play yogurt, which I'll, I always remember because I was like, there's chocolate yogurt. Mm. I never knew that that, that mm. existed. So she's like, oh yeah, you have to buy it. it kind of defeats the purpose, but <laughs> of yogurt. Um, and, uh, and so as we were sitting, she was eating, she and Ariana were eating the yogurts and, and, uh, and I was, um, was feeding Eden. Um, she told I said, you know, let's get ready. Let's go to court. Um, we, we don't know what time we need to be there. So, so let's just go now and we'll wait. And, uh, she told me that, uh, that she had had a conversation that, uh, earlier in the morning. Um, you know, I guess I hadn't been awake yet, um, with, with Phoebe and that, um, uh, yeah. yes. Yep. That she, uh, was going to not, uh, extend the restraining order in exchange. Phoebe Remy was going to take the apartment key away from Jared um, to give her some time. And so um, then she proceeded to show me a text message on her phone that confirmed that that Phoebe had taken the the key away from from Jared. Um, so we, um, I said, well, like let's go do something. Let's let's get our minds off of what, what happened. And so uh, we packed in the car and uh, headed off to Drumlin Farms. Was Ariana aware that, um, from her perspective, Daddy had allegedly hit Mommy the night before? Did Ariana know about this? Yeah, so he's, she saw him screaming um, at us when he burst into to my house. Uh, she was... She she was there and she was screaming back at him. So who was screaming? Ariana was screaming back at him. And her dad. Yeah, yeah. Can we get back to Phoebe Remy just for a minute? I, I mentioned to you last night. I read to you from a statement that Jerry Remy put out that uh, appeared as a sidebar to the Globe story on Sunday by Eric Moskowitz, in which he said, uh, despite reports indicating Jennifer was encouraged to drop the restraining order that was granted on August 13th, which was the Tuesday before she was killed on the Thursday, no one in my family encouraged her to do so. Based upon what you described is that an accurate statement by Jerry Remy? Um, no, and and this this was brought up again with uh, um, Jerry's interview on um, W E E I this morning, um, where he calls my claims nonsense. Um, but um, from what I'm only saying, what I experienced and what I saw, and um, and that obviously contradicts what 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 the, the Remy's statements are. And by the way, one more text that bears mentioning that Jenna related. To, uh, pardon me, that Jen related to. She was quite close with Jenna Remy, who was Jared Remy's sister. Jenna Remy texted her that day. To-